So hello, um, welcome participants to this afternoon's session for the 2020 Patent Literacy Symposium. Um, this session is Morphology Matters, Using Bases and Affixes to Develop Vocabulary in Students of All Ages with William Van Cleve. My name is Karen Deary and I'm joined by my colleague Sadie Hetrick as your facilitators for this afternoon's session. Just a few housekeeping um, items that I would like to share before we actually get started. Um, handouts for this session are included in the Schoology folder for this session, so you can find it under session 23F, like in Frank, and the title of the session and today's date, June 11th. Um, and I checked earlier, so they should be there. This session will be 75 minutes long and it is being recorded. The recorded will be recording will be available on the Patent YouTube channel in the near future. Um, you do have access to chat or to ask questions. Um, I will, uh, Sadie and I will help collect the questions and funnel those through to Mr. Van Cleve as, and he can address those as we um, have an opportunity to do that. I believe your video feature should be turned off. If not, please take care of that item um, and, and take a minute to turn off your video just so that it's less distracting um, through the presentation. We would love for you to tweet out all of your new learning and your excitement about our literacy symposium. Please use the hashtag PA uh, Lit Symposium 2020. And with that, I would like to introduce you to our wonderful presenter for this afternoon, Mr. William Van Cleve. William is in private practice as an educational consultant whose specialties include morphology and written expression. An internationally recognized speaker with an interactive, hands-on presentation style, William has presented on effective teaching practices at conferences and schools, both in the United States and abroad since 1995. Recent projects include consulting with three schools as part of a literacy grant in Montana, participating on the MTSS Writing Standards Committee for the state of Pennsylvania, implementing several trainer of trainers projects using his sentence structure approach, and writing a series of workbooks and a companion book on developing composition skills to complement his sentence approach. The author of three books, including Writing Matters and Everything You Want to Know and Exactly Where to Find It, as well as a number of educational tools and activities, William has served as a classroom teacher, tutor, and administrator in the private school arena at various points in his career. William, thank you for joining us this afternoon. I'll turn it over to you. Great. Welcome, everybody. Hope you enjoyed your lunch. Looking forward to a productive session with you today. I'm going to try to make this interactive, even though I know you cannot talk with me, but I've got some sort of hands-on activities I'm going to break up throughout the workshop. So hang in there as we get through a little bit of the foundational stuff first. Um, just so you know, right here on the front slide is my Facebook page, W period, V period, C period, Ed, my website, and my email address if you want to contact me further after the workshop. So today we're going to talk about morphology, about the study of meaning parts in words uh, to guide vocabulary. And as we're doing that, we'll actually, as a side benefit, talk a little bit about the benefits for decoding and for spelling as well. Because morphology really is not just a study of vocabulary, it's more than that, it's more powerful than that. So morphological awareness, or the study of these meaning parts, the awareness of these meaning parts uh, in words, is a strong predictor of reading ability, vocabulary knowledge, and comprehension. So what that means for us is, if you have good morphological awareness, you are likely to develop or to have good reading ability, vocabulary, knowledge, and comprehension. And obviously, the converse is also true. If you struggle with morphological awareness, that may, in fact, impact or make you struggle with your reading ability, your vocabulary knowledge, and your comprehension. We should develop this morphological knowledge, which is something I'm hoping to experiment with you enough today that you get kind of a grounding of. Um, we should develop this morphological knowledge to build word sense, to build literacy skills in general, to build our knowledge in content. So that would be a science or a social studies content, to build polysemy, and polysemy is the understanding of multiple meanings through the study of word families. So poly means many, and semi is uh, related to the word semantics. It means many uh, meanings, excuse me. So polysemy literally means many meanings or multiple meanings. So Pete Bowers, wonderful researcher and uh, thinker in the, in the world of morphology, in 2010, uh, 
he and his colleagues did a meta-analysis or a study of studies. And he looked at 22 morphology studies. And they found that uh, morphology instruction benefits learners. And what's particularly interesting and powerful for us is that it particularly benefits uh, our less proficient readers. So it benefits everybody, but we get more of an impact even for our less proficient readers. Morphological uh, instruction that best develops word sense has two features. One, it is integrated with other aspects of literacy instruction. So we're not going to teach morphology in an isolated vacuum like today is morphology day. We're going to look at it and examine it and consider it embedded in the other content areas of our instruction. And two, that it includes a problem solving approach. And that's a little difficult to model when I'm presenting and I don't have an audience to interact with, but I'm going to try to show you some of that today as, as the webinar unfolds. Problem solving approach means we're posing interesting questions, we're posing interesting problems, and we're working through a possible solution or multiple solutions. Rather than my uh, providing you or presenting you with the answer, we're going to work to uncover it. At least that's the model that's, that's uh, proven to be an effective when we're working with students. Again, a little bit tricky to, uh, to display or to, to model that kind of approach when you're in a webinar like this, um, but I'm gonna do my best to show you some of that. All right, so Louisa Motes, uh, who is keynote uh, for this webinar, um, she writes in uh, Speech to Print third edition, with systematic teaching, Morphological awareness develops in tandem with phonological and orthographic awareness beginning in first grade. And I can tell you that uh, in Louise's third edition, when she said this, it kind of rocked me. It was a powerful, powerful statement from a major literacy voice uh, in our field. Because for a long time in our field, we have considered morphology to be something you address in middle school or high school. It's something you address once you've got your spelling and your decoding going. And that's really not what the research says. And in fact, Louisa is adding a voice to that, that uh, important point, that morphology is something we're doing at all grades. Uh, in all areas throughout the curriculum. It's not something we start later on once the other literacy aspects are in place. So I've got some terms to discuss with you and these are going to frame our discussion. And I'll try to keep these to a minimum. I don't wanna drown you in sort of um, a stuff to memorize, if you will. But I do want to frame our discussion so that we have a common vocabulary to speak about this important subject. So a morpheme is the smallest part of a word that has meaning. And the suffix eme, eem, means unit, okay? So this is a unit of meaning. Morphology then is the study of these meaning parts or these morphemes. And finally, morphological awareness is the awareness that words are comprised of these morphemes. Now that may sound like a whole lot of language, but what I'm saying about morphological awareness is that a student is able to see a word and or hear it and recognize the different meaning parts or that it is made up of these different meaning parts. So on a very basic level, that would be something like jumped is made up of J-U-M-P, jump, and the suffix ed. That would be morphological awareness, that jumped is not one meaning part, but instead to a base and a suffix. Words are made up of morphemes, including these bases and affixes. For this discussion today, we're going to use the word base instead of the word root. And if I have time today, I'll explain why. But base uh, seems to be a more accurate and precise term for what we're going to be looking at. So we're going to talk about bases and affixes. So there are two kinds of bases in the language, free bases and bound bases. This is a very important distinction. Our earliest learners, our youngest learners, they are likely to be working primarily with free bases. And these are bases that can stand alone as their own words. So the examples I've given you here are tree and port. They are in fact words. They are also bases. So these are called free bases. They stand alone without the need of an affix to make them into a word. Bound bases are a little different. Bound bases also are the core meaning of the word, just like a free base. But bound bases need an affix to make them into a, a word that we know in English. So for example, the best base I know to talk about this with is the base S-T-R-U-C-T. And you can see it over there on the left. 
S-T-R-U-C-T is a meaning part. It means build, and it's a good base. It occurs in a number of words. But what's important to note about that is there is no word S-T-R-U-C-T. I need to add something to it to make it into a word. That makes S-T-R-U-C-T a bound base. So I would need to attach suffix U-R-E perhaps to make structure or prefix C-O-N to make construct. So you can see that adding these affixes to the base S-T-R-U-C-T makes S-T-R-U-C-T into a word. So that makes S-T-R-U-C-T, that base, a bound base. It requires affixes to be an actual word we know in English. So again, my youngest learners are going to focus primarily on free bases. They may come across a bound base. You may choose to teach it as it incidentally occurs in learning. But the littlest learners, it's a little abstract to go for those bound bases. Probably makes sense to stick with the free bases. And then upper elementary grades, you know, maybe third, maybe fourth, they can start to experiment with some of the bound bases on up into middle and high school, of course. So an affix is a prefix or a suffix that can be attached or affixed to a base. And when I teach kids about affixes, I like to show them a picture affixed to a wall. And they probably haven't heard that word. That's not a common word um, uh, for them to have heard. But I talk about affixing it or attaching it you know, uh, to that wall. And that's exactly what we're doing with these words. We are uh, affixing prefixes and suffixes to these bases. So this is the word rewinding. And I would have the students say the word back to me. And I would ask them what the free base is. And it's wind. And then I might say, why is it a free base? And the answer to that question is, it's a standalone word. It's its own word. Now we know that RE and ING are both affixes. They are things that affix to the base wind. Now there are two different kinds of affixes in the language. There are prefixes and there are suffixes. And you probably already know these terms and they're probably comfortable with you. I wanna tweak perhaps your definition just a little bit today though. A prefix is an affix placed before the base of a word. What I wanna avoid saying is that a prefix comes at the beginning of a word. And that's because oftentimes words have more than one prefix. So if you have a word with more than one prefix, only one of those prefixes comes at the beginning of the word. So if we say that prefixes come before the base, we're really getting things accurately for the learners. And as they add other prefixes to words, so they have a, you know, a two prefix or a three prefix word, they still, the, the, the definition and the understanding they have of prefixes still works. Suffix is same thing. Let's not say that suffixes come at the end of a word. Instead, let's say that they come after the base of a word, because we can actually have up to four suffixes at the end of a word, or excuse me, at the end of a base, or after a base. And they can come in a variety of different orders, obviously, so we wouldn't want to say that they're at the end of the word. In rewinding, our E is a prefix, while ING is a suffix. And I'm guessing you know that, and that's probably pretty comfortable for you. Little kids learn this pretty early. They may learn it as five years old. Um, they certainly are picking it up at six and seven years old. So you may be wondering to yourselves, why is William spelling all of these things instead of pronouncing them? And what I want to argue to you is something that Pete Bowers taught me uh, a number of years ago. He suggested to me that I work towards spelling my affixes instead of pronouncing them because the pronunciation varies, but the spelling doesn't. So consider re-examine and reply. Consider convex and connect. And you can see that those is the same prefix, R-E, and then C-O-N but it's pronounced differently according to the base it's attached to and the way it's being used. Look down at my suffixes, and you're probably familiar with suffix ed and those tricky pronunciations. Here's jumped and dented, replicate, and senate. And you can hear how these suffixes are also pronounced differently. So if I spell prefix re, 
or suffix ed, instead of trying to pronounce it, then I give kids accurate information. So when they hear it, when they see it, they'll recognize it. And when they hear it, they can say, okay, how would that be spelled? How would that be constructed? Rather than I heard r or re, but it, let me do it that way, I'm sorry. I heard re, here's the word reply. I don't hear re in reply. It must not have the re prefix in it. So let's apply our knowledge to a few words. The word underactive, and again, I would have the students practice saying that word, and then I would say, what is the base? And they would say base ACT. And why is the base a free base? Again, because it stands alone as its own word. What's our suffix? The suffix is I-V-E. Not I've, not if, but I-V-E. And what's our prefix? U-N-D-E-R. And so I have the word underactive. And under and suffix I-V-E are influencing or shifting the usage of the word, uh, the base uh, A-C-T. Now in the word construction, we've got a slightly different structure. S-T-R-U-C-T, you'll probably notice, is a bound base. We already mentioned that it can't be its own word by itself. It's got to be in the context of a prefix or a suffix to make it a word. So I can add prefix C-O-N, I can add suffix I-O-N, and I can do different things with that, and that makes construction. That word is basically built the same way as underactive, but I'm starting with a bound base, and you can see the prefix and the suffix a little bit different. Okay, what the research says is that 20 prefixes and 30 suffixes account for the majority of derived forms. That said, if you know the prefix of in a word, you will not necessarily know the word. So I, I give you the word preamble. Well, you may know that P-R-E means before. That does not mean you know what a preamble is or what the preamble is. Knowing the base though, and seeing how prefixes manipulate its meaning can be illuminating. Using this base focused approach, will provide multiple exposures to the essential affixes in a variety of applications. So you're likely to learn them anyway. What I mean by that is, I may not wanna do a whole lesson on PRE. What I may wanna do is learn bases and each time that a base could take prefix PRE, I would attach it and we would talk about how PRE means before and it applies to that base. So it's really powerful to do the multiple exposures as you're uh, instructing bases. All right, so let me do a little bit of history for you guys. And the, uh, the language of origin piece uh, comes from uh, my mentor, Diana Hanbury King, and also Marsha Henry, who's another guru in the Orton Gillingham world. And the pyramid that I'm gonna show you is uh, Beck and McEwen's um, from the 80s. And it's the three-tier vocabulary model that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. If you're not familiar with this vocabulary model, I'm going to walk you through it really quickly here. It's really something you want to think about. It's a great framework still to this day for thinking about vocabulary. So do me a favor just for a moment and ignore the red arrow and ignore the fact that I'm talking about Anglo-Saxon. And let me just talk to you about the Blue Pyramid just for a second. The idea behind the pyramid is that we're organizing the words in the language into three tiers. Tier one at the bottom is our basic words. They are easily understood. They're easily explained. They typically would not appear on a vocabulary test of any kind. The only exception to that might be ELs who might not know the English word for something that is relatively simplistic and straightforward because they may know it in their native language, they probably would, but they wouldn't know it in English. But with that exception, these are words that would not appear on a vocabulary test. They might be difficult to decode, they might be difficult to spell, but they're not going to be difficult to define. Tier two words are precise, interesting, sophisticated words. They are common in text, but they are uncommon in everyday language. So you see them in reading, you might use them in writing, but you're unlikely to come across them in just casual conversation. So I've given you some good examples. Consequently, preceding, and fundamental. These are words, again, I don't talk in these words very often, 
but they're likely to show up across disciplines in text. And that's what's important. They're common in text. They could be in a history book. They could be in a science book, an economics book, an agriculture book, lots of different possibilities. They're not unique to one field of study. That's our tier two words. Now our tier three words are domain specific. So they are likely to appear in one content area, not others. So the best one I know and the one I always think of when I'm thinking about tier three words is the one in the middle there, photosynthesis. This is a word that only is used in biology. It's not just, it's not even just science, it's biology. I recently asked a social studies teacher uh, when the last time he used the word photosynthesis was, and he jokingly said, photosynthesis is the reason I became a social studies teacher. So again, this is domain specific. It is particular to one field of study, and you're not going to see it outside of that field typically. Now, what that means is it's important when you're studying photosynthesis but it doesn't build your general vocabulary because you're not able to use that word in other disciplines and in other areas. So it has less of an impact than tier two words. Okay, now that I've done my Beck model for you, let me talk to you about the red arrows. A lot of our tier one basic words come from Anglo-Saxon and Anglo-Saxon is the language of Old English. It's the Angles, the Saxons, the Frisians, and some other tribes came over from mainland Europe to England. And they, over time, developed their own language that we refer to as Anglo-Saxon or Old English. Those of you who had to read or enjoyed reading Beowulf in, in high school, you were reading something that is that we have discovered and found in Old English. You did not read it in Old English, though, because unless you're a linguist, you probably couldn't translate it. So Anglo-Saxon has a lot of our simple, straightforward words, but they often have odd pronunciations to their spellings. Words like to, the number, words like of and from. So this is actually a page uh, from Beowulf. It's the first page in Old English. And just a quick glance, you can see, hey, wait a minute. This may be Old English, but it doesn't look like English to me. Um, you're not recognizing those words, nor could you write a translation unless, again, you're a linguist. Now, what's amusing about this is I love teaching kids Shakespeare because they'll say Shakespeare is written in Old English. And I frequently will show them a page of this and they'll realize they don't have it that bad that, you know, uh, Shakespeare is typically called early modern English. Nothing like this. So this is a page in Old English. So I thought we'd play around with a few words here. Let me get my annotation tool out for you. Now, again, this is a little tricky to do without an audience to talk to, but I'm gonna kind of walk you through the kind of conversation I might have with a kid, and I'm gonna play both roles, if you will. So what I would do with this, uh, this wait a minute, I've lost my annotation tool. Okay, what I would do with this is, well, that's not what I meant to do. Wait a minute, I lost my annotation tool. All right, let me try again. What I would do with this is I would look at the word cats and I would ask the student to say it and the kid's gonna say cats and I'm guessing the kid would probably know what that means. And then I'm going to ask the student, how many morphemes or meaning parts do you think are in the word cats? And what I found in my experience is that about half the class will tell you one morpheme, one meaning part, and half the class will tell you two morphemes two meaning parts. And I find this in teacher workshops as well sometimes. So what they, the concept behind one morpheme would be, you know what, cat and cats, it's really the same thing. They're both these four-legged objects, they meow, they're pretty independent, they don't act like dogs, you get the idea. Okay, except here's the catch. If I asked half the room to draw cat and half the room to draw cats, the drawings would look different. All of the cats pictures would have more than one cat. So what you're going to end up with is an understanding that the S is a suffix and cat is a base. And in fact, I would ask the kids what kind of base. This is a free base because it can be its own word. Now, occasionally I have a kid who thinks that at is the base. That's interesting and I'm excited by that. 
The kid's really wrong about this, but that doesn't matter. What I'm interested in is where the kid's head is, what the child is thinking, and how we can help the kid uncover or discover what might be going on. So I would ask the kid, okay, let's pretend for a minute that at is the base in the word cats. Let's go there, okay? What do you think the prefixes and suffixes are? So we would box S and we'd be right. That's good, that's suffix S, marks a plural. I'm excited about that. And then we'd have to look at the other, the rest of the word, and we'd have to decide that C is a prefix. And I would ask the kid, what other words have prefix C? And we would suddenly discover, wait a minute, this isn't right. That's one way to go. Another way to go would be to ask ourselves, hey, what do at and cat have in common? Well, they rhyme. They end with a short vowel A and the consonant T. So they're good Dr. Seuss words, but they're not morphologically related. They don't mean anything that has anything to do with each other. So that's another reason why it would be bad to have base AT. But again, I would never use the word bad with a student. What I would do instead is help the kid uncover where his thinking was off and help him uncover the correct understanding instead. All right, so I've got cook and that is a base. I'm happy with that. Now, in, and I start slowly, and if kids struggled with this, we would do some more like this. And then I'm looking at the next one, and I've got base cook. I'm excited about that. And I'm going to box suffix ing. Okay, now the next word may give you pause, and oftentimes I have um, teachers and students who are confused by this. You might see this as a compound word. However, in this case, it's not. Over is a perfectly good prefix. And one of the reasons I know this is because I can contextualize it. And that's a powerful skill for students to have. And what I mean by contextualize here is that I can think of other words that have prefix over in them, like overdue or overwhelm or overactive. And by doing that, I'm getting a family of words that I can kind of think of in relationship to overcooked. And that's nice for me to be able to contextualize this. Can't always do that. Sometimes I cannot think of any words that go with something. And sometimes when I'm working with a student and he doesn't think of any, I'll give him a few other words and say, hey, does this make you think differently? Or are you considering something different here? So instead of overcooked having two bases and being a compound word, over is actually influencing the meaning of cook. It's cooked in a certain way, right? It's cooked too much. It's cooked over. You could also have something undercooked. I guess that would probably be raw, if you will. So overcooked, over is influencing the word cook. It doesn't focus, uh, it doesn't function, excuse me, like a compound word. And we're going to look at a compound word in the second column. So I'm gonna come back to that in a minute. Okay, now I'm on the second column and I have the base ship. So again, if a kid said hip was the base, we would wanna talk about that and we would figure out that S is an affix, but it's only an affix at the end of a word, right? We don't have prefix S. So, and also hip and ship are not related morphologically. They rhyme, but they're not related morphologically. So ship is going to be our base. And then I've got ship and I've got an interesting prefix we haven't looked at yet here. And this, it turns out here, means again, so we're going to ship it again. Okay, that's kind of cool. And we can think about other words like redo or reenact or review. And we can think about how those words also have that prefix re and what that might mean. Okay, now we've got an exciting compound word, which is good because we were talking about how overcooked was not a compound word. So in the word shipwreck, I do have ship and wreck. And this is a thing, a shipwreck. It's not the ship wrecked. A shipwreck, you can probably kind of close your eyes and visualize, what does that look like? In the same way that a cupboard is a board for your cups. Now we have a $2,000 hutch, but you get the idea. A shipwreck is the wreck of a ship. The sunset is the set, setting of the sun. Um, those are compound words, but overcooked is not the cook of or from your over. 
That doesn't work the same way. So that's not going to be functioning as a compound word. Then I've got shipment. Ah, now meant is not a word, doesn't have a meaning uh, as a word or a base. It is a suffix, it's a noun suffix. And a lot of our suffixes actually help us determine part of speech. So I have shipment and that turns the verb ship, I'm going to ship something, into the thing that I shipped, the shipment. So meant turned that into uh, a noun. And I think of the word judge and judgment, for example. Um, and I can contextualize, remember that powerful word? I can think of other examples that might help me frame my discussion or my thinking. So these words, um, I think there, no, uh, actually there's one affix that's not. Most of the word parts on this page are Anglo-Saxon. There's one exception, um, but most of these uh, word parts are Anglo-Saxon. Um, and they are, whether they're Anglo-Saxon or not, they are super basic, pretty simplistic and straightforward. Good for our younger kids, good for our struggling older kids who are just beginning to, to fall into morphology. And by simplistic and straightforward, I didn't mean um, that they are uh, trivial or insignificant. I meant that they're good groundwork uh, uh, morphology stuff to do with kids. I would not want to do some of the more advanced ones until I felt confident that the students were comfortable with these. Okay. So I'm gonna work through these now. So I've got like and suffix N-E-S-S. -E -S. I think that's pretty straightforward. Now, liking is interesting. My friend, Marsha Ramsey, who founded the Green Gate School in Alabama showed me this concept. So this is pretty straightforward, except that like has moved, right? It shifted, something's happened to it. It dropped an E and the reason it dropped an E is because it's uh, in front of a vowel suffix. That's a nice common rule in the orthography of the language. But here's the deal. What Marsha taught me was for this one thing, when E's drop, this is the only rule in the language where something drops actually. It's pretty powerful to know that. When the E drops, what she does is she codes it below the line. And I like that because it shows the drop. So you can show that E underneath. Then I've got likelihood. So here's like. I've got suffix li. Now, you probably know the word likely. That i changed. So I might write a y above it to show that transformation. I wouldn't put the y below it because remember, I'm only putting the dropped e below it. Then I've got hood. That's my second suffix. See, I told you. Some words have more than one suffix. So if I said that ly was at the end of the word, um, that would be uh, misleading, wouldn't it? So instead, I'm going to say it's after the base. And then here's one more, likeliest, same structure. And I'm going to code above. All right, I'm gonna move ahead, but I think you get the idea. The three over on the right function very similarly to the ones I just did. Karen, any questions about that coding piece that would be relevant right now before I move ahead or are we okay? I'm looking at the questions now, just updating what I have. Um, I do have in the word overcooked, Yep. Is it okay to send that? Yeah, that's is, fine. Is over considered a prefix? Good. Yes, it is. So the word over, it's a real word. That's true. But in this word, it's not functioning as the word. It's functioning as a prefix influencing the meaning of cook. And folks, I don't think I said this because it's usually written on my directions page. I'm boxing affixes and I'm underlining bases. And I should have said that right up front, I apologize. Anything else, Karen? Yeah, in the word shipment, how would you correct a student who insists that M-E-N-T is a word because it sounds like meant? Good, so uh, that's a great question. So the first thing I would ask them is what does meant mean? Okay, and if they say, well, it's the past tense of mean or we get into that, fine. Then I would do this. I would show them what meant looks like. Okay, so 
It's not spelled the same way, is it? Okay, so we need to know that. I don't really care if the kid can spell meant right now. That's not really the focus of our lesson. And then I would show them, I would say, does shipment have to do with meaning the ship or um, some sort of meaning behind the ship? Or is there some way that that works with mean? And the answer is no, right? And then finally, I would give them some other words. So judgment's the one I mentioned to you, but there are some others. Um, and I would frame that with a family of these M-E-N-T words as suffixes. Um, and that would help them clarify. So instead of just saying, hey, you're wrong, which is not a good approach, I would want to show them the difference between what they're thinking and what we're doing here. Anything else about that? I Just one quick question since you mentioned it. In the differences between your boxing and your underlining, there was a question about the importance of the colors green, blue, and red when you were indicating pre Ah, uh, before. Okay. So that's a good question. Um, I do not do a lot with color coding. I know a lot of people do, and I am not opposed to it. Typically, when they do that, they mark green for prefixes because that's at the beginning and you go on to the base. And they mark red for suffixes because they're after the base towards the end of the word. And that's the framework. Um, I don't do a lot with, I mean, I'm color coding here in this visual. I do not do a lot of color coding with my students personally when I'm working with them, but I'm not opposed to those who do. Anything else, Karen? Okay. Let me throw one more at you while we're sure. here. I've seen T-I-V-E and T-I-O-N as a suffix. Is We're going to get to that later. I'm going to cut you right yeah. off because I have some slides. I didn't mean to cut you off, but, but yep. I know I'm getting to that. That's a really good question, and we're going to get to it in a little while, so I'm excited about that. Perfect. Let's All move. All right. Thank, Thank you. you, Karen. That was perfect. I appreciate you. Okay, so um, let's move ahead. So here's our Latin lens. So what I'm telling you guys is not that all tier two words are from the Latin. That's not true. But a good percentage of these tier two academic vocabulary words do in fact come from the Latin. Um, these are those words that are across multiple disciplines, words like consequently and preceding. So that's kind of useful for our thinking. Okay, and there are some characteristics of these Latin-based words, and I've left them in the, the PowerPoint. I'm not going to read all over them today, or over them all today, but they're there for your access. Um, and uh, we're going to talk in a minute about final stable syllables and suffixes, but you've got some pieces uh, here that will help you illuminate some of the characteristics. Also, on my website, there's a downloadable handout that's more of a vertical activity booklet handout, and that does some of the activities I do in workshops on this topic when I've got the interaction ability to have you all trying things and experimenting things with me. Okay, so I've given you this really pretty word web, um, and I built this around the word education because we're all educators. And I want you to understand that um, D-U-C-E and D-U-C-T are what's called twin bases. We'll talk a little bit more about that. But it's basically two bases that come from the same origin in the language. And they mean lead, if you will. Okay. And on the top, above that D-U-C-E, D-U-C-T, I've given you words where you will, um, where they're using, I'm sorry, where they're using D-U-C-E. And below, I've given you words where the base is D-U-C-T. They both mean the same thing. They're both coming up from the, uh, the Latin uh, language of origin, origin, excuse me, into our language. They're both bases that mean the same thing coming from the same origin. I've given you two suffixes, A-T-E and I-O-N, to give you education. And the prefix E, and the prefix E has a number of words. Um, and the, it's a version of EX, the prefix, uh, out of. Um, and that basically educate is to lead out, um, to lead out of the darkness, if you will, um, or to lead out of uh, uh, ignorance or lack of knowledge. So as educators, and that's suffix OR, that's somebody who does that, that leading out, if you will. Um, we are tasked with educating the people in our care, if you will. Oftentimes children, but sometimes adults as well, of course. So this word web, um, one of the things I like to do with kids is if we come across a word like educate, um, we might look at the base D-U-C-E and we might say, what are some other words that come from this? Um, and, and we can think of these words and show ourselves, um, show, show our group the different words that are related to that, um, that allow us to think about leading in a, a variety of contexts. So then when we learn a base, we are in fact learning 
uh, an access point to a whole family of words that all come from uh, or use, I'm sorry, that all use that base. So I've given you three words here. Let's talk. Okay. So in the word confide, fun word, this is a prefix C-O-N. And I'm going to tell you that sometimes I'm in workshops and I start kind of whipping through the meanings of prefixes and the teachers in the workshop, they say, and it, it always bums me out when they say this, they say, oh, I could never learn all those prefixes and oh my gosh, I could never teach this. Well, I'm going to tell you a secret. Some of these prefixes are used so often that you will learn them through teaching them. You don't have to know 150 million prefixes to be good at this. There are about 15 prefixes that get used in hundreds and hundreds of words. So I know C-O-N, not because I memorized 4,000 words and have a PhD in linguistics, not at all. I learned C-O-N because I have used it with kids so many times that I know it basically means with or together. And F-I-D-E is my base, and it means believe or trust, if you will. So if I confide, kind of believing or trusting um, that you'll keep yourself, uh, that you'll keep, you know, my confidence, if you will. You've also got things like fidelity and infidelity and infidel, which is usually shattered on horseback in some sort of um, uh, old war movie, if you will. Um, and so, and you also, believe it or not, true, uh, the dog named Fido is a dog you can trust or believe in. And take a look at contraction. There's that prefix C-O-N again. How exciting that I still know that it means with or together. T-R-A-C-T is my base. And we're still going to hit that T-I-O-N, I-O-N thing in a little while, for those of you who are asking. And my suffix is I-O-N. T-R-A-C-T means drag or pull. So a contraction literally drags or pulls things together. So you can think about reproduction, obviously one version of contraction. You can also think about the language contraction like do not becomes don't. You can also think about the word contract. If you and I sign a contract, it drags or pulls us together into one agreement. So that also works. So my prefix with or together, T-R-A-C-T being drag or pull, and the I-O-N basically turns that into a noun for our purposes right now. All right, counter proposal is a fun word too. It's a little tricky because the base is so far into the word, and sometimes kids get tripped up by that. But if I gave you just the word proposal, you would probably be more likely to see it right away. There's a base pose, and you know the word pose, like I pose a question, and that's a free base as it turns out. And then I have suffix al. I have prefix P-R-O. Prefix P-R-O means for or forth. So a pronoun stands for a noun. If I propose something, P-O-S-E means put or place. I'm putting it forth or I'm putting it forward. I propose. And counter proposal, counter means against. It's another prefix. So I'm offering something that's against that proposal. I was in a wonderful school uh, uh, in an upper elementary classroom in Houston, Texas. It's a school for dyslexic students. Terrific, terrific school. And I was working with fifth graders. And one of the exciting things about uh, being in teacher training as much as I am now is when I do get to model teach with actual students, it's so exciting and so much fun. I know some of you at the end of your year and you've been working with kids all year and you need a break. But when I get to do this, it's so great. So I was in a class and I was working with the prefix multi, M-U-L-T-I, I should have said, sorry. And I helped them and they already knew that it meant many. I was pretty impressed with them. And we started coming up with multi words. And we came up with, they came up with multiply and one of them said um, multicultural and somebody said multidimensional. And then somebody said multi-proposal. And I didn't know these kids remember, I'm just model teaching. And I said, gosh, that's not a word. And I did that badly, actually. The kid looked crestfallen and, and I, because I had told him his wasn't a word. And I said, no, 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 no. That means we get to figure out what it could mean. And we get to think about whether it would be a cool word in our language and what have you. So now remember, I've got 15 kids in the room and six teachers in the back behind me. And I said, what do you think multi-proposal could mean? And the kid's thinking and he's thinking. And I can tell, you can tell when a kid's thinking because his eyes kind of light up. And he says, I know, 
A multi-proposal is when a man asks a lot of women to marry him. And of course, that was the highlight of everyone's teaching day that day. We all laughed. He was on top of cloud nine, if you will. Um, and, and I said, okay, that's not a real word, but you know, et cetera, et cetera. So we're thinking about that word, what it could mean, how it could be used. Um, and, and perhaps uh, out of his definition, why we shouldn't have that as a word in, in our language. Okay, so again, we're playing around these words, we're experimenting with these words, we're thinking about their meanings, et cetera. Um, uh, Karen, do I have any uh, questions about the Latin breakdown words? Because this would be a good time for those, but if they're more general questions, I can do them later. Oops, I think any of the questions were still just re related to those suffixes. Okay, good deal. Okay, so here's the slide those of you who've been thinking about T-I-O-N have been waiting for. Okay, so there are a number of different ways to think about the language. On the left, if I look at a word phonologically, I can think about the sounds and I can think about the syllabication. So there are three syllables in contraction and I can tell you that everyone would agree that you would say this word and divide this word contraction. You can tap it, stomp it, clap it, whatever you like. There are three syllables. You can loop it, scoop it, divide it, split it up, what have you. That's phonological. That's for pronunciation because P-H-O-N-E means sound. But morphologically, the word is different. The base is T-R-A-C-T. The suffix is I-O-N and the prefix is C-O-N. Sorry to go backwards on that, but the, the, part, the part you're questioning is the I-O-N-T-I-O-N. I know you, you folks are all okay with the C-O-N. So then you have to ask yourself, why on earth does this matter? Why is William at 2.48 in the afternoon bothering me with this? Well, let's talk. T-R-A-C-T means drag or pull. I mentioned that to you folks. So I have contracts, contracting, contracted, contractual, contractor, excuse me, contractor, subcontracts, subcontractor, et cetera. So why on earth would I say, hold on one second. Why on earth would I say T-R-A-C is the base here just to allow for T-I-O-N as a made up suffix? The reason people do this is because T-I-O-N says shun, but it says shun. That's about its sound. It's not about its spelling and it's not about its morphology. So I don't wanna have T-R-A-C-T, whoops. I don't wanna have T-R-A-C-T over here and then a special T-R-A-C just to accommodate T-I-O-N. Doesn't make any sense. This is about morphology, about meaning parts. It's not about phonology. So let me go a little more into that. Let me get my annotations cleared up here. So I've also got other words that have different prefixes and suffixes, words like abstract and detract and extracted and protractor and subtraction and also just plain old tractor. And you don't wanna say that there's a special base just to accommodate T-I-O-N doesn't make any sense. So do I have this big epiphany with kids and say, oh, T-I-O-N isn't a suffix? No, I tell kids the truth. T-I-O-N is a final stable syllable. It's a blob of letters, if you will, whose pronunciation remains consistent. It says shun. That's fine for pronunciation, for what it says. But when I'm looking at the word contraction, I want to make sure that I see the T-R-A-C-T. So I see how it relates to all of the other words that have T-R-A-C-T in them, all of which have to do with dragging or pulling. That's the power of our morphology. And what Louisa Motes says is morphology or meaning trumps sound or phonology in the, the uh, spelling of hundreds of words. And her article actually is a little old. I think if I asked her, she would probably say thousands of words now. There are so many words where the meaning trumps the, uh, the, uh, the sound, the phonology, where the meaning trumps the sound in accessing the spelling of a word. Okay, um, uh, 
Karen, are there any questions about that? Yeah, let me go back a little bit. Why did you not write the drop E under counter proposal? Can we, can you? Oh, I can. That would be a fine thing to do. No problem at all. I just didn't do it. Gotcha. Okay. Um, they're looking for reliable resources. Several questions about reliable resources for the definitions of affixes, prefixes. Good. I'm going to do that at the end in resources. Gotcha. That's a great question. And I've got that listed. So I'll cover that. What grades yep. would you suggest beginning to introduce Latin bases? So, so that's a good question. I typically start them around fourth or fifth. However, if one came up earlier, I mean, kids could handle this one. This is a pretty uh, transparent one. Um, I could do this younger with kids, but typically I think there are enough Anglo-Saxon bases. I've got the hiccups, I'm sorry. Uh, I, 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 there are enough Anglo-Saxon bases to really fill up a K through three curriculum without intentionally going into the Latin ones. Um, but I would, like I said, again, if a Latin one came up or it happened to be in the curriculum, I wouldn't be like, oh, we don't do Latin until fourth grade. I wouldn't be that militant about it. I just think that typically is what makes sense. Great. Um, another one back to those ION, SION. This is a, I typically teach that the suffixes ION, SION, and TION sound like shun but recently discovered it can have a different sound, such as an onion, religion, union. Yes. Explain. So I wouldn't teach that S-I-O-N and T-I-O-N are a suffix ever. They are not suffixes. The T with the I-O-N makes a certain sound, right? As opposed to onion or union or what have you. Mm -hmm. um, so so uh, if you're going to teach T-I-O-N as a unit, you're going to teach it as a unit for sound, pronunciation, phonology. It's a syllable, but it's not a suffix. Those are different. So the suffix is I-O-N, you're right. And, uh, and depending on what comes before it, that's going to influence and change up the pronunciation. All right, I'm going to move ahead before I get uh, too far in. Is that okay, Karen? Perfect. Okay, great. So my tier three words are my Greek-based words. And they are actually, so I didn't give you percentages, which is kind of cool. So tier one, Anglo-Saxon words, they're about 20 to 25% of the language come from the Anglo-Saxon. More than 50% come from the Latin. So it's crazy. Our English language is made up more of words that aren't from English. And then my Greek code, which is oftentimes tier three. So, so let me phrase that clearly. About six to 13% of the language comes from the Greek. And a huge number of Greek-based words, words coming from the Greek, appear in our tier three work. Okay, so photosynthesis is certainly a Greek-based word. Now, that said, here's a cool number. You might listen to six to 13 and go, okay, why do we even learn this if it's so few words? But here's the punchline. If you're looking at the language and you go into a biology text, or a history text, and you look at the terms in lessons in that biology text, if you will, you're going to find that over 70% of those terms are from the Greek. So that little insignificant six to 12 suddenly packs this enormous wallop when you get into these higher level content-based words. And that is such an interesting thing to share with science teachers, history teachers, et cetera, when you think about morphology and vocabulary. Okay, so these words, um, I didn't do, we're not going to do breakdowns of these because we're going to write our time if we do, but I did do a little model lesson based on a Greek, uh, Greek word, and I'm gonna or a word from the Greek, and I'm going to show you that in a little while. So here is a Greek-based web. I did autobiography, which I love. I used to teach uh, Richard Wright's Black Boy in ninth grade American literature right after Huck Finn. Um, really, really important book. Uh, and we would talk, and it's an autobiography, it's a memoir, an autobiography, and we would talk about autobiography. And we would look at the, the base G-R-A-P-H, which means write, by, it's usually by, um, uh, or I'm sorry, it's always by, usually there's an O um, as a part of it, but a couple times they're not. And so bio meaning life, B-I-O, excuse me, meaning life. And then you've got A-U-T, um, A-U-T-O, uh, if you will, um, and that means self. And again, I've made some word webs based on this. And this has three core meaning parts. And there are some Latin words 
are Latin based words with more than one base. But in Greek, there are a lot, actually. There are a lot of words that have sort of a two base structure. Um, this one actually has, I would argue that uh, it has two bases and then it also has a, a prefix structure. But there are three core meanings here. And this is writing about your own life. Okay. So this is what I mentioned uh, about Louisa. So I love doing this with kids and teachers. If you look at the word two and you ask yourself, okay, how do I learn to spell this word? And I know some teachers would say, learn it as two over pronounce it, but two is a funny word. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay, we're gonna take a 30 second break here while I come out and do my answers, sorry. I changed slideshows right at the same time and I screwed this up, hold on. Sorry, everybody. Five more seconds and we'll be back in. Okay, so two is a fun word, and it does obviously mean two. And I've heard people talk about how you can have the W has two humps, and that would be the way to play around with it, um, et cetera. And I've heard people say, well, I teach it with the other two twos. That's fine. I can see that you would want to do a differentiation thing. Um, I worked at a school for dyslexics a long time, and I can tell you that my students often knew that the W was in it, but they would sometimes spell it T-O-W which is really problematic because of course that's a real word, right? So it spell check didn't even always notice it. And what I found was one of the best ways to learn how to spell too was to think about it morphologically instead of phonologically. Because if you sound out too, the only letter that's behaving itself is the T, right? T oh yeah, I spell that with a T, good. But the rest is a little off. The O is saying something kind of funny. The W isn't even saying anything right here. But if you look at the other words, that are related to it, you will find that a bunch of them exist in the language and that the only word where you can't hear the W is that gosh darn pesky too. The other ones, all of which have a meaning banked into, these other words, they all, you can hear the two. So if, excuse me, you can hear the W, my apologies. So if you say two, and then you think twin, tw twin, I not only get that there's a W, but it also helps me remember that the W is right after the T. So I'm making a, a morphological connection between two and twin, and twin's pronunciation is helping me with the spelling of two. And so all of these words have something to do with two, and they're all based on that with our meaning part. And even, the candy bar Twixt is two bars. They didn't randomly come up with that name. It fits the candy bar and what it does. No, I do not work for that company, nor am I advertising for them, but it is true. Okay. So if you look at these words, I'm showing you some correct spellings on the left, some incorrect or wrong spellings on the right, and I might ponder why. Well, there are patterns in English. And one of the things I would know about cheese is if I spell it the way it's spelled in the wrong column, it suggests that I have more than one G. So basically that it looks like this. That's a problem. So in our orthography, in our spelling patterns, what we'll find is that we have a silent E here. And the E is not serving to make the, the vowel team long or anything like that. It's serving to anchor the S so that it's not perceived as a plural. Same thing here, and this one may be even more illuminating. So folks, I don't wanna be unclear, I'm sorry. So you would not box that, that S, right? Because this is the incorrect spelling altogether. So here at give, what we know in English is that V never ends a word, never. I did have somebody recently mention Gorbachev, but just so you know, that is not an English word. So here are all situations where we've got the E. And then T's, this is actually a real word. This is the plural of T. There were several kinds of T's offered or what have you. Um, uh, and so we need that E to make the word T's. Okay, and I do have an answer slide here that shows you what I just said.
So here's the deal. It's not crazy. My mentor, Diana Hanbury King, wrote a book called English Isn't Crazy. There's a, mis, uh, a misrepresentation that English is insane or crazy or you just have to memorize all this stuff or blah, blah, blah. There's a system. It's not a super simplistic system. There's a lot to it. But there's a system for understanding the way English works, both its meaning parts and its spellings. We can make sense of orthography by assuming that almost all letters in a printed word have a functional relationship to sound and or meaning. If you look at a letter and you say, why on earth is it there? Chances are very good that there's a genuine reason why it's there. So I'm going to go through some of these a little more quickly so I can take some more questions, but here's the deal. If you look at the base column, you see H-E-A-L, and you see that in word one, I have heal, and in word two, I have health. In word one, I have please. In word two, I have pleasant. Inspire, but inspiration. And I can tell you in the word inspiration, anybody who's taught older kids who are struggling spellers, the only part of inspiration that's a dice roll is this thing. And there are a whole lot of ways to spell er, but there are no dice rolls if you can think of the word inspire in the word inspiration. That will lead you to the spelling. I'm, I'm going to skip over P-O-R-T because it works the same way. But a famous one that everyone uses is sign and signal. Ah, signal explains the G in sign. Pretty powerful stuff for kids. Okay. So I want to show you a little bit about the matrix. Um, Pete Bowers introduced uh, this to me the very first time. And there's a way to make these on the computer as well. I've given you kind of a crazy over the top one here, D-U-C-E. What I like to do in workshops is I build these with teachers and I build these with kids. Um, so this is, a, everything on here works. And there are a whole lot of words we can pull from this matrix. And over on the right, you will see what we call word sums except they're not quite straight addition problems. You'll notice that the equal sign is replaced by an arrow. And that's because we're showing a process. So for example, in uneducated, that E is going to have to be eliminated. So it's not a straight addition of uh, the way you would think of it. So we show that arrow to show the process of the, the word or the, the process of the accumulation. So you'll see, um, here's one, for example, re-intro-duce. So what I do with kids is we put the base up, D-U-C-E, and we get kids to generate words, and they come and they help me build the matrix in front of the group, and then they'll do it themselves with butcher block paper and those kinds of things. So this is a twin base piece. I am gonna skip this because we're a little tight for time. The word attack piece took a little longer than I wanted it to. I am proving to you that there are four suffix words. That is what this slide is. Here you go if you were wondering. And here's a three prefix word. That's all these were is just, hey, I told you something before. You might be trying to think of a word. Here's some words for you. Okay, so um, this is, uh, oh, the, the name things. Um, this is a teacher, her last name is Prizo. She works in Pennsylvania. Um, and she gave me this picture to use in her workshop. This is awesome. I'm so grateful to her for sharing this with me because this is a hands-on in-class uh, uh, morphine wall. And what she recommends, what Pete Bowers recommends, what I recommend is that you, over the course of the academic year, you build a morphine wall and that you show that you help kids discover morphemes and then help them add to the wall. And if you're working in small group or one-on-one, -on -one, what I would do is I would use little manila folders and I would have small post-its and you can build individual ones for the kids you're working with in these smaller groups. Especially if you're like a push-in or you have different groups coming to see you throughout the day at different levels, et cetera. So on the left, you have uh, prefixes, including a kind we're not going to be able to talk about in an hour. And then in the middle, you'll see bound bases and free bases. 
And on the right-hand side, you'll see vowel suffixes and consonant suffixes. And what happens now that we've built this really cool uh, uh, wall is when the kids come across a new base, they can walk up to this kind of like a detective and they can try out different prefixes to see what might make words. They can try out different suffixes. They're building this thing. And again, guys, you would not put this up in September. You would build this over the course of the year with the students using discovery learnings. So they would come across some, they would try things out. They would say, oh, I think that's a base. And you can see where um, the teacher has built a word with the kids underneath using the post-its. And you can see some of these matrices down here. All right, I don't wanna get too far into that because we're running this out of time. Great place to jump in. I know we're, we're short on time, but th there is a question that says, what are the suffixes in inspiration? And this would be a perfect. Ah, uh, A-T-E is one suffix and I-O-N is the other. All of your all of your A-T-I-O-Ns are A-T-E plus I-O-N. It's a great question. Thank you. You bet. And uh, a word where you can hear it a little better, folks, might be uh, graduate, graduation. Because we don't have the word inspirate. So I know that sounds a little weird. Um, but it still works the same way, even though we don't have that word inspirate. So replicate, replication, etc. All right. So I built you a, a cool Greek-based morpheme, but what I'm inclined to do now is this. I'm gonna leave this for you in the slides. It is really well described. I wrote it all out for you. And there are all these really cool things around. And I use the word asymmetrical. So I'm gonna skip over that part. I built you too much content for this one hour. But what I wanna do is share this with you. And then I'm gonna close and let you ask a few questions. Application activities. Remember, problem solving. Don't give them a matrix, give them a base and have them generate words and create a matrix of their own. Don't give them a web of morphologically related words, lead them to create it. Don't give them a meaning to memorize, help them uncover it on their own and help them see how it relates to other words that contain the studied morpheme. Build application through having students read sentences and passages containing the word or morpheme you're studying. Have them generate sentences of their own using words containing the morpheme as well. The curiosity you develop in students will apply to their future word investigations, even when you're not involved in the process. And that's really what we're all here for, is to instill in kids systems, processes that they can use when we're not there to support them. So what I've got now is a couple of slides. Um, one thing I wanna tell you is this, the best way to do this is to get it and try it. You do not have to have nine courses in all of this to make this work. You're gonna make some mistakes. I make mistakes. We trip, we fall, we get up, we dust ourselves off and we move on. We try things out, we look things up, et cetera. I've given you some tools. Somebody asked for the best morphology uh, website. Edem Online is it, this is in your thing. Also, the underlined piece is how to make the matrices on the computer, but the best darn matrices around are the ones you build with butcher block paper or pieces of paper with kids. I've given you citations on word origin and history. Some of these you can get from me, but a lot of these you can get from other places as well. I've given you some activities and uh, card decks, including my morphology deck. I've given you some general vocab books. Remember I mentioned Beck and the three-tier vocabulary model. That's right here. And I've given you a whole lot of curriculum and things like that. All of this is available from me um, for different grade levels and different levels of struggling. And then I've given you a citation page. And that took a little longer than I thought it would. I'm sorry, um, but I'll take questions for as long as we can. Karen, what have you got for me? Okay, we have a few minutes. So, um, Maybe this was answered. What grade was the uh, morphology wall in and would a morpheme wall be appropriate in a first grade classroom? Ah, good questions. Okay. I think that teacher is a sixth grade teacher. I would have to ask her. Um, it's fifth, sixth is where she was. Yes, it would be appropriate in a younger kid classroom. Obviously, it would not be as extensive as that one. So, you know, you might have, I've got a, a kindergarten classroom at one of my schools that I'm consulting with. They have like S, E, D, I, N, G. They got just the basics going. That's great. That starts them on the premise of this word building piece and the morpheme piece and sorting by prefixes, bases, and affixes, or excuse me, and suffixes. So I think that's great. 
Okay, I know it's in the references. The author of the book, um, English Isn't Crazy. That was Diana Hanbury King. Um, she is my mentor. And this was all on, these are the word origins one. Um, Diana was a great lady and a force to be reckoned with. And this is her book. Perfect. Where can you start with students that don't have a lot of background vocabulary? If they're struggling to come up with words for the word webs or the matrices? I would start with the Anglo-Saxon stuff I did with you guys. Well, mostly Anglo-Saxon stuff I did with you at the beginning. I would start very simply. I also might do something like this. Here, I'll go crazy with you guys. This is always risky in a webinar with 4 million people in it, but let's take a shot. Give me one second and I'm gonna share a little uh, doc for you. So I might do something like this. I'm sharing, give me one second. Okay, so I might do something like this. I might start with something super fun. Here we go. And I'm gonna build a little matrix with you guys right now. How fun is this? So I'm gonna use the word jump. And you may say to yourself, wow, I don't know a whole lot of words with jump. Ah, but you do. Here we go. I'm doing this with a trackpad, by the way, folks. That's why this is so awful. This is not how you do this with kids. So I have ER. I have ING. Pretend these are in the box, please, because I don't want to waste time, but I have ED. Uh, what do you like? Uh, what do you act like when you've had three cups of coffee? Well, you're jumpy. I had a kid recently, he said unjump. And I said, well, let's talk about unjump. And is that a word? And I think it's not a word, but that's okay. Sorry, I'm in the wrong track. But what does unjump mean? And the kid was hilarious. He goes, unjump, it's when you jump and you wish you could take it back. And I was like, that's awesome. That was why I came to work today. That, that made it for me. So that's not a word I don't think. I'd be super shocked if it were. Uh, but the kid is exploring with the idea of not and understanding on and what have you. So you start with very basic ones. You're starting to build the language. You start to think about what those words mean. That's a great thing to do. And you can also work with the phonology, the spelling, like jumped. How are we going to spell that? Well, you know what? We're going to do our word sums. Mm -hmm. Etc. Okay, how's that for a convoluted answer? <laughs> what else? Okay, there were some several comments and questions around teaching English learners. Um, that might be a whole other session. There is much respect for the fact that you included them in your explanation of tier one words. Are there any specific recommendations for L's when teaching morphemes? So I would tell you that first, I have to be honest with you and tell you, I do not have a huge background in the L population. That said, my exposure to discussions with L professionals and my interactions on morphology is oftentimes that's a really powerful place to do morphology because they have a native language and oftentimes the roots are related, are, are from the same place. So, so they share a right root. So I give you bueno, bon, beneficial. They don't all look alike, but guess what? They all come from that same origin piece. And then you can play around with, I think I spelled bon incorrectly. Um, uh, you can play around with um, the, the language and the origin. So I hear a lot of um, uh, L instructors telling me that they love the morphology piece because oftentimes it can help a kid take an English word Related to something they know in their own native language and make sense of it both for spelling and this one isn't a good one for spelling, obviously, but in meaning at least that that's a key or an access point. But again, I tell you folks, my strength here, my superpower is not in the L population and there are other people um, who could speak more eloquently about this. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we're at 315. That is the end of our time together this afternoon. So I encourage you folks to reach out if you have further questions and email. I also do a morphology intensive that's limited to 25 participants and that's a longer workshop. So please email me if you want more information about that. Excellent, thank you. So if you haven't already, make sure you download the presentation slide deck from the Schoology folder. The, um, Mr. Van Cleve's contact information and his website are included on that um, 
initial slide in that presentation. But I want to thank you again, William, for joining us this afternoon. We always appreciate the information that you bring to our sessions at Patton and to the state of Pennsylvania and to all the people who attended the session this afternoon. Again, this session was recorded and will be available on the Patton YouTube channel in